Welcome all here. If you guys want to grab uh, a chair and we can get started. Thank you all for coming. This is the first lecture of this year's John and Margaret Friesen Lecture Series. My name is Conrad Stace and I'm the archivist at the Mennonite Heritage Archives. And the archives shares this building space with the Mennonite Heritage Centre Gallery. And so you get uh, the privilege to see the next, two ex the next exhibit that is opening tomorrow. Uh, the exhibit here where you're sitting features Leaving Canada, the Midnight Migration to Mexico. This is the exhibit's first stop on a tour across Canada. It's produced by Andrea Claussen from the Midnight Heritage Village with the Midnight Historical Society of Canada and the Plett Foundation and supported by the Midnight Heritage Archives. On the upper floor is the exhibit by Margaret Shaw McKinnon entitled Ukraine, Close to Home. Now, curator Sarah hodges Kliznik says that together, these two exhibitions engage a dynamic conversation about home, tackling competing ideas of coming and leaving, lost, preserved, memory, legacy, determination, assimilation, freedom, citizenship. She suggests that the emotions and stories echo through the years ultimately asking viewers to consider the joy, hope, and spirit that shines through trauma and the meaning of a place called home. There's a few seats up front here as well. Seats in the second row over there. The official opening of this gallery exhibit is tomorrow night, March 10th, at 7.30 p.m. I encourage you to come out and hear more and meet the artists. In my role as archivist, I'm pleased to work on a committee with doctors Paul Dirksen, John Isaac, and Chris Huebner for this year's Friesen Lecture. The John and Margaret Friesen Lecture Series in Anabaptist Mennonite Studies is co-sponsored by Canadian Mennonite University, the Mennonite Heritage Archives, and the Center for Many Brethren Studies. It began in 2002 with lectures delivered by Dr. Abraham Friesen, the generous donor who initiated the lecture series. Now I'll invite Dr. Paul Dirksen to introduce our speaker. Thank you, Conrad. Uh, welcome here, everybody. It's good to see you here. I'm pleased to introduce uh, Professor Gary Waite, who is Professor Emeritus, Department of History in the University of New Brunswick. He's been involved in innovative research in Anabaptist studies for much of his career, and part of his specialty in the history of religion in the early modern era is Anabaptism in that era. Uh, perhaps his best, uh, most well-known books are Heresy, Magic, and Witchcraft in Early Modern Europe, and then later Eradicating the Devil's Minions, Anabaptists and Witches in Reformation Europe. Those books, along with uh, courses that he's taught in the field have resulted in him being uh, known as the witch doctor on uh, the Fredericton campus. He's currently in the final stages of involvement in a team project, uh, which you can see on the screen. Uh, it's called Amsterdamnified, the greatest title of a research project that I've ever heard. Uh, it's uh, funded by the Social Sciences and Humanities Research Council of Canada and it has a Winnipeg connection. One of the researchers uh, is Dr. Nina Schrader, who's one of our alumni. Whatever success she's had, we take full credit for it as a university. Uh, the title of the, uh, of the project is Religious Dissenters, Spiritualist Ideas, 
and urban associationalism in the emergence of the early enlightenment in England and Low Countries, 1540 to 1700. A good title, not quite as snappy as uh, Amsterdamnified, however. One of the outcomes of this project is forthcoming. Uh, Professor Waite's book titled uh, Anti-Anabaptist Polemics, Dutch Anabaptism and the Devil in England, 1531 to 1660, is being published by Pandora Press. He has published other books, numerous articles, many awards. I'll just mention one award. He won the inaugural University of New Brunswick Award for Excellence in Research in 2018. We've on campus already experienced uh, Professor Waite's generosity. A number of us on the faculty uh, gathered with him yesterday for an informal discussion on one of his essays. It was very stimulating, and uh, I, for one, enjoyed that time very much. The overall title of this two-part series, The Neglected Role of Dutch Anabaptist Innovators in the Scientific Revolution and Early Enlightenment. Uh, the poster, uh, which I think is just great, was designed by Craig Turleson. Make sure you get a chance to look at some of the details of it in passing. This morning's lecture, Mennonites as Social and Technological Innovators in the 16th Century Netherlands. Please help me to welcome Professor Gary Waite. Set my timer. Thank you. Thank you for coming out to this um, morning uh, event. It's a, a true honor to have been invited. Uh, and I would like to thank you also for the hospitality that I have received. Thanks to uh, Paul, especially for uh, not just inviting me, showing me the hospitality, but making the process of getting here so much easier. It's not easy to get out of Fredericton anywhere. Um, my pleasure today is to discuss the fascinating and little-known history of Dutch Mennonite contributions to the advancement of knowledge in a variety of fields, including theology, social and religious organization, as well as in technology, science, and philosophy. Given the time constraints, I will be selective. Uh, but it helps that others have been working on this subject, such as Pete Visser, who was invited to deliver the Friesen Lectures in 2020, but at the last minute was frustrated by the COVID-19 shutdown. His work on Mennonite writers, translators, and printers has revealed how they got the works of the great philosophers, René Descartes and Baruch Spinoza, into the hands of Dutch readers, it was Mennonites. Even more, Visser has shown how Mennonites like the famed painter, Karl van Mander, and the brilliant playwright, Joost van den Vondel, invented new genres in the literary arts. Or Mike Drieger, my research collaborator in Amsterdamified, he did the website if you visit it, from which these lectures originate, who has very recently commented, Dutch baptizers of adults played a small but quite significant role in the rise of the European Enlightenment and religious liberalism, a series of historical connections that might be ignored by those who study the more conservative, rural, and separatist branches of the Mennonite family tree. And finally, Ernst Hamm of York University, who presented a couple lectures uh, on the subject of science and Mennonites in the Dutch Enlightenment about 10 years ago, and which were subsequently published in the Conrad Grebel Review. In that discussion, Hamm concluded that there was no single explanation for why, quote, many Dutch Mennonites became involved in the sorts of activities we would call science, but I will argue that their engagement with science was deeply tied to their integration in the social, economic, and cultural life of the Netherlands." Unquote. Ham appreciates the incredible innovation of Dutch Mennonites in natural philosophy or science, but sees that as a result of their broader integration into Dutch society. This is the standard assumption made by most historians of philosophy and science, that Dutch religious nonconformists, like our Mennonites, adapted the new philosophical ideas developed by the intellectual elites or giants, and then added some helpful elements along the way. The Global Anabaptist and Mennonite Encyclopedia Online, for example, says this in its entry on philosophy. 
In the 17th century Dutch Republic, Mennonites entered a period of creative philosophical ferment as the Dopskazinden were exposed to the more liberal ideas of the collegiate groups who themselves were influenced by the philosophies of René Descartes and Baruch Spinoza. In other words, the influence went one way, from philosophers to collegians and then to the Mennonites, the most liberal group of whom, by the way, preferred to be called Dopskazinden, which means baptism-minded people. Yet more recent scholarship is clear that Dobbsgesinden, who emphasized a spiritualistic approach privileging the inner religious life over external expressions, were among the major leaders of the collegians, helped shaping that organization. And as I will suggest in these lectures, they helped formulate the ideas that the philosophers then developed into their intellectual systems. Most recently, Ruben Baus has produced an important study of the intellectual contributions of those within the so-called spiritualist streams, especially the famed secretary, playwright, and controversialist Dirk Volkerts Kornherr, who in the later 16th century combined a humanist's uh, emphasis on reason with a spiritualist belief in human moral perfectibility and a depreciation of external religious rites and dogmas. Uh, himself influenced by the Anabaptist spiritualist David Joris, Cornhair too denigrated all denominations as corrupt since the only true church was invisible and open to all Christians who loved God and neighbor. This is the essence of spiritualism. Baus has shown how religious nonconformists non like Cornhair shaped the unusually innovative and stimulating culture of the Dutch Republic, contributing to the new philosophies of Descartes and Spinoza, among others. The Dobbsgesinnen were thus significant actors in rethinking key ideas relating not only to theology and church organization, but also to philosophy and science. Another of the common blind spots of historians of philosophy is religion itself, although recent scholarship is showing how, for example, the Puritans of England innovated in science thanks to their artisanal background and more independent approach to church organization that allowed them to think outside of older traditions of knowledge production. And historians of philosophy and, um, also tend to see nothing new of any consequence in their field until around 1640, they say, when Descartes, Thomas Hobbes, Baruch Spinoza, John Locke, and Isaac Newton all began puzzling through how humans could know a thing and the nature of the cosmos and humanity's place within it. Yet, it was precisely in the preceding decades when religious nonconformists, like Anabaptists, spiritualists, and Mennonites, were already rethinking religion, society, and the natural world in the freer environment of the Dutch Republic. Their contributions to new approaches to knowledge creation and social organization, I suggest, provided the more famous philosophers with the raw materials they needed as they worked through the problem of the human condition. It's noteworthy that Descartes, Spinoza, and Locke all lived in the Dutch Republic when they composed their most groundbreaking works. An important point. Here they could interact with residents of all religious backgrounds, given the Dutch Republic's approach to religious uh, diversity, allowing for a rich cross-fertilization of ideas more uh, possible there than anywhere else. Spinoza especially had several Dobbsgesinde and collegiate friends who actively debated with him and who actively and in crucially supported his work. While this is a fact often mentioned, most scholars of Spinoza assume the intellectual influence went only one way again. And even when Spinoza took a position contrary to his dopes into friends, we must remember too that any new ideas are typically developed through discussion and debate. And Descartes, who liked to pretend that he thought up his ideas all on his own, was similarly immersed in Dutch society producing a child with his Dutch maid, for example, and getting to know a Mennonite cobbler and self-taught Copernican and writer of navigational works, Dirk Rembrandtsen van Nierop, the guy in the lower right, who impressed Descartes, as did Dirk's Mennonite neighbors of Zandam in North Holland. Uh, this area here is called the Waterland region, and large minority and in some places majority of the population were Mennonites. They're the Waterlanders. Ham reports 
In fact, that Descartes is said to have occasionally attended local Mennonite churches to hear the preaching of peasants and artisans. Although Mennonite worship was not, however, the only means, attending Mennonite worship was not, however, the only means by which Descartes could have come into contact with Anabaptist ideas. For thanks to the realm's religious diversity, nonconformist ideas had become part of mainstream cultural discourse. The famed religious toleration of the Dutch was itself a product of the history of Anabaptism. To see how this development transpired, we need to go back to a century before Descartes' arrival to the heyday of the militant Anabaptist movement to see how the Anabaptists themselves helped push the traditional boundaries around knowledge, creation, and social organization in new directions. Sorry, just drying out. On June 25th, 1535, the Anabaptist-controlled city of Münster in Westphalia fell to its besiegers, ending an experiment with an Anabaptist state that had, for its short life, become a center of hope for thousands of people who took seriously the prophetic message of lay preachers like Melchior Hoffman that Christ was returning very soon to establish the kingdom of God on earth. Thousands of Dutch Anabaptists tried to make it to the city of God but were turned back while well, smaller numbers captured a Frisian convent and Amsterdam City Hall, both of which were quickly recaptured, or ran through the streets of Amsterdam with drawn swords proclaiming the judgment of God, or in February 1535, and this is the upper right image here, stripped naked and walked through the city streets crying woe upon the sinful population. They were, in their own words, proclaiming the naked truth. The excitement was palpable, and most people feared the wrath of God in the last days. For most Anabaptists, the ignoble end to the city of God and the government's continued persecution was so disillusioning that they abandoned the movement entirely. Others were led by Menno Simons to turn away from such prophetic predictions and the violence associated with Münster to establish the Stillen in dem Land the peaceful folk who would no longer seek to transform the social political order along biblical lines, but do so only within their own community of the faithful. Once persecution had ended by 1579 in the Northern Netherlands, the pacifism, biblicism, and standards for ethical behavior set Mennonites apart from other denominations, and they were, of course, excluded from government and military service. They poured their energy into their artisanal and business activities, like their Calvinist neighbors, and became major contributors to the growth of the Dutch Republic's economic and social success. Despite the failure of its prophetic hopes, Anabaptism gave to ordinary lay people the confidence to interpret scripture for themselves, to have an authoritative voice normally excluded from them. Some of the Anabaptists did not give up their eschatological hopes in the immediate aftermath of Münster. They focus now on the artist of Delft, this guy, David Joris, I began my career with him. I'm a little tired of him, but here we go. Who in 1536 experienced some visions commanding him to take leadership over the movement's remnants. Already inclined to mysticism, Joris expected that he would be unveiled as the new Messiah on Christmas Day, 1538. When that failed and dozens of his supporters arrested, Joris too turned away from literal fulfillment of scripture to spiritualism an approach to religious identity, emphasizing the non-physical or inner significance of religious beliefs, rites, and practices, and depreciation of external manifestations. Instead of retreating into the safety of the communal fellowship, as Menno had done, Joris and his supporters retreated to their inner consciences. This religion they could practice anywhere and pretend to be orthodox among their neighbors, as Joris did successfully until his death in Basel. Spiritualism was, moreover, not exclusive to the Anabaptist community. For many others, Reformed and Catholic and some Lutherans, practice it not only to avoid confessional conflict, but also as a superior method of achieving a relationship with the divine. It's like mysticism. They followed especially Jesus' summary of the divine law as love of God and neighbor. Whether called spiritualists, or as Calvin preferred to call them, libertines, these individuals formed informal networks and wrote and attracted considerable readership for their publications. Now, Menno's concept of a purified community and Joris's emphasis on inner individual purity were not actually at odds, despite their inability to come to consensus. 
It was instead possible to maintain these two approaches in a creative tension within the Mennonite community. As the Dutch revolt against Spain raged around them, the Anabaptists now watched from the sidelines. In 1579, the northern provinces signed the Union of Utrecht, stipulating that each region would be responsible to manage its religious affairs and that no one's conscience was to be violated. The leader of the Protestant forces, Prince William of Orange, was inspired by the spiritualist Cornhert to promote complete freedom of religion. That's what he wanted, complete freedom of religion. But he had to compromise with the hardline Calvinists. Amsterdam and other major cities, however, informally promoted freedom of religion by allowing dissenters like Mennonites and even Catholics to worship within their private spaces. While the Reformed Church remained the public church, but it was not a state church. Membership in it was voluntary, an innovation seen nowhere else. The Anabaptists and spiritualists who had for years pleaded for an end to religious compulsion had won the day. Many other Protestants similarly wanted a broader public church than Calvin's. In 1618, these remonstrant critics of Calvin were finally forced out of the Reformed Church. Some of them organized a new form of worship without clergy called the Collegians which were open to any who professed the core Christian principles of love of God and neighbor, and any could speak as they felt moved by the spirit, women and men both. Many Dobbsgesinden joined these collegiate organizer meetings, which became incubators for new approaches to religion, scripture, and philosophy, not to mention social organization, well ahead of the English Quakers or the French Salons. And it was with these collegians and Dobbsgesinden that Spinoza found his greater greatest supporters. Now, I spoke a moment ago, ago about the creative tension between Menno's reliance on the Gospels to craft a community of without spot or wrinkle, and the spiritualists who sought the same for each individual through the Holy Spirit's inner enlightenment. In the 1620s, this tension led to a conflict within the Dobskas and the community over the question of whether or not the written text of scripture was adequate for salvation or needed direct inspiration from the Holy Spirit, the inner word. This argument has been portrayed as a rift between spiritualists on one side and rationalists on the other, but that's not the case. Instead, those supporting the two-word hermeneutic, led by the pastor and informal medical practitioner Hans de Ries, also used their rational fac faculties to interpret scripture, but simply considered the text authoritative only when its meaning was revealed by the inner word and really only when it's applied to uh, promoting piety. For these Dobbsgesinden, it was possible to apply the latest critical approaches to the written text since it was not divine on its own. The other side, led by the extremely unconventional Dobbsgesind innkeeper, distiller, translator, writer, printer, and inventor Jan Tunisen, he's quite the character and I don't have any pictures of him, uh, was afraid that some of the two-word side, women especially, might follow the emphasis on the Spirit's inspiration to take on authority for themselves. He didn't want that. Tunison, in fact, published a pamphlet, you see the title page here, describing a number of alleged episodes when Dobskas and women and men were led by the Spirit and visions to make prophetic proclamations to the disturbance of the community. They were telling the rich to share their property with the poor. <laughs> that disturbed him. The issue boiled down to who could determine the meaning of a text or an inspiration. As long as that decision was kept in the hands of the Dobskas and elders, it seems there would be no serious problem. Now, another point I've been making is this. While most Dobskas and Mennonites believed in an independent Holy Spirit that could inspire, inspire an individual as they read the scriptures, some of them followed the direction taken by David Joris in his late writings that essentially merged the spirit with his own enlightened mind. This was, of course, a natural development for Joris, who had already internalized spirit beings such as demons and angels anyway. There's no demons or angels out there, they're all in here. This meant that the inspiration of the spirit to interpret the Bible was, in, a sen in essence, the inspired individual's own mind. This approach gave greater permission for the individual to follow creative interpretations, not just in biblical studies, but in all fields. For to believe that one's mind was enlightened by the divine gave one greater freedom to think outside the boxes of confessional and orthodox traditions. While well, Doris and his fellow Dobskas and the leaders were never as explicit as Joris in this, 
Their more moderate approach, called the two-word hermeneutic, proved a powerful force in 17th century nonconformist circles. Now, even though the language used by each side against the other in this short battle of 1626 uh, suggests a battle between spiritual enthusiasm and excess and extreme rationalism on the other side, each group called the other Socinian. The name of the Polish re refugees who emphasized the use of reason in interpreting scripture and who denied the doctrine of the Trinity. The argument began when de Ries called the Amsterdam tailor preacher Nittert Obeson a Socinian rationalist, and Obeson returned the favor by calling de Ries a spiritualistic fanatic. Great friends. Jan Tunison then accused de Ries of incorporating elements of Socinianism in his teaching. Really, the dispute boiled down to how much weight to give to individual inspiration or to the literal meaning of the text, and who could ensure adherence to Mennonite tradition. And we must remember that Tunison was shaped himself by spiritualism's promotion of religious diversity and interaction. He created a fascinating and formal network of reformed English, Puritan, Jewish, and even Muslim scholars to do his translating work. The dispute was quickly resolved in the confession of faith in favor of the two-word hermeneutic signed. As a result, the strong current of spiritualism that could inspire free thinking continued to flow through the Dobskazin community, as seen in the fascinating literary works of Jan Philipson Skabalia, such as the illustrated spiritual dialogue, The Wandering Soul in the Pleasure Garden of the Mind, the Lusthof des Gemuts. My mouth is too dry to do Dutch which first appeared in 1635 and, went, and which went through dozens of editions. According to Piet Visser, it was, a, it was second only to the Bible in popularity in the 17th century Netherlands and a major devotional text for Mennonites elsewhere. I suggest the tension between those who wanted a rational interpretation of scripture and those who preferred greater flexibility alongside the text proved a creative force in thinking through how to know something. Well, we have time for only a brief overview of some of this innovation, which began with Menno's innovation in social organization and which helped inspire a desire for non-authoritarian leadership and governance more widely. They chose their ministers by lot, trusting in God, so that many artisans and other lay people, lay men, were selected, and these preached sermons that each Mennonite community could determine if they were faithful to Menno and to the Gospels. The preachers were excluded from the kind of university training in scripture interpretation and logic that the Reformed had, meaning that they were not as constrained by those orthodox traditions. Some Dobskazin pastors received higher degrees, but not in theology or philosophy. Instead, they chose fields that could provide an income, such as medicine, since initially preachers were unsalaried. This has at least two ramifications. First, they would have not been as fearful of innovative interpretation of scripture as the Reformed neighbors, who were constrained by quite strict approaches to hermeneutics and to theology. Second, the Mennonite sermons would instead have reflected the ways of thinking of skilled artisans, merchants, and medical practitioners, with efforts to illustrate their message with examples drawn from real life experience, inventions, and medical knowledge. For example, one of the supporters of Obeson in the two-word dispute was this uh, fellow, the physician preacher Jan Willemsen of De Rijp in the Waterland, who in 1647 published a collection of sermons. So we can see his medical mind working through the text. He opposes the superstition and popular magic of the people. He calls uh, Catholicism religious magic. And this is a polemical position that he shared with his reformed contemporaries. Also, like most Protestants, he describes the devil's temptation as occurring in the desert of our hearts and not in any external fashion. These reformed tended to see witch hunting as a Catholic thing. And like his reformed contemporaries, Willemson denied Satan the ability to perform miracles and limited him really to an illusionary role. Bringing his medical training into theology asserts that the devil cannot make people ill for that is caused by a humoral imbalance. So Dr. Willemson restricts the devil to tempting people to turn their faith away from God to the kind of high knowledge of the universities that results only in confessional disputes. So he's criticizing the university training in theology and philosophy. 
Or Satan deludes the simple folk into accepting visions as divine messages, something that Tunison had also complained about uh, and which Will Willemson worried would encourage these folk to re refuse his prescribed medications. So Willemson preaches like the physician he was trained to be. While his demonology on the face of it is comparable to that of his reformed contemporaries, his criticism of high knowledge reveals an influence from spiritualism and the democratizing tendencies within the Anabaptist tradition. Believers should rely on the medicine that God had allowed to grow from the soil, as Christ had taught the ill to turn to their master of medicine, he wrote. So use natural means to heal. So Williamson uh, compares his dual ministry of physician of the soul and physician of the body to that of Jesus. This is very typical. Uh, although instead of doing miracles, it's Galenic medicine that he uses. For his part, Hans de Ries also made a living on healing, but he instead followed the alchemical approach of the controversial battlefield physician Paracelsus, who believed that disease was introduced into the human body, the microcosm, from the outer world, the macrocosm, in the form of seeds, and that treatment required specially prepared chemicals. Paracelsus was also, however, a spiritualistic religious reformer. This isn't as well known who reinterpreted scripture in some very creative ways. Some dopesgesindens, such as de Ries and Cornelius Drabel, followed this approach of using alchemically distilled chemicals, the quinta essentia, to heal the afflicted. And like Willemsen, de Ries saw this as part of his ministry for healing the inner conscience. He too used examples from medicine to describe the spiritual world and depicted Christ as the medicine of the soul. Whether Paracelsian or Galenist, Men Mennonite medical practitioners who doubled as preachers sought ways to heal both soul, mind, and body. Most importantly for us, though, they also read scripture through a medical practitioner's lens, which predisposed them to seek naturalistic explanations for seemingly inexplicable phenomena often taken to be the work of the devil or signs from God. The impact of this approach is seen in the impressive chronicles from the first quarter of the 17th century by the conservative old, Fr uh, old Frisian Mennonite clothes dealer and writer Peter Jans Fisk, who in his history accounts found naturalistic explanations for most of the supposed wonders in the historical record. For Mennonites, whether conservative or Dobskazinde, the supernatural was focused on the inner person and the Mennonite fellowship. The natural world was thus subject to rational analysis, and the miraculous or demonic explained according to the science of the day. Here then, the turn away from the visionary and miraculous events of Münster led to a separation between the natural or outer world and the inner world, where supernatural forces were still at work. This is one reason why Mennonites became major composers of works of inner piety, including guidebooks on how to find the city of peace, is described by Doris's colleague Peter Peterson, and which reached a literary peak in Skabalia's fascinating spiritual travelogue, Lusthof des Gemuts. So religious matters were focused on the inner spiritual journey, while secular matters subject to rational analysis, as was the text of scripture. Some Dobskazinen believed the spirit within was providing them with new ideas in technology, such as windmills, or in medicine, for example. While well, this turn away from scripture as an authoritative source of knowledge for the natural world was happening elsewhere, our Dobbsgesinden were in many respects pioneers, and being in the Dutch Republic, they could pursue this different approach without fear of arrest. The difficulties faced in 1613 by Galileo, for example, when he argued that the earth revolved around the sun in apparent contradiction to the biblical account of God commanding the sun to stand still so that Joshua could eradicate his foes are, are, are well known. He denied that heliocentrism was contrary to scripture and affirmed that the Bible was in fact no authority at all on the nature of the cosmos, only on faith and ethics. Our spiritualistic nonconformists had come to that conclusion decades earlier. Even conservative Mennonites could reveal strong spiritualistic attitudes, such as Twisk, who as an elder of the old Frisian Mennonites of Horn, wrote numerous works for Mennonite audience, a confession of faith and a martyrology, faithful to the teachings of Menno. He also wrote other books 
for a wider audience, and in these we see a completely different mentality, a strong spiritualist approach to promoting religious toleration and religious diversity, praising the Dutch Republic for allowing people of all faiths to live there. Well, during the two-word dispute, Tunisian asserted that some of Derisa's people, the peace city citizens, he called them, the city of peace, and there's the Dutch, I won't try it again, as I say, my mouth is too dry, led by the preacher and windmill builder Peter Peterson, were claiming to be led by the Holy Spirit to invent new types of water mills or means to walk under water. This is what Tunisian says in his pamphlet. Since one of these, the Mennonite alchemist Cornelius Jacobson Drabel, did invent a boat that could travel underwater, it seems that Tunisian was onto something. Yet the great irony here is that Tunisian himself was an inventor, but presumably did not claim divine inspiration for his creations. He just did that as a purely naturalistic thing to do. According to William Brereton, an English visitor to Tunisian's six-story Amsterdam Inn in 1634, and you can see on the map of where, where it is, it no longer exists. The Mennonite had created his own perpetual motion device, a most curious waterwork at an infinite charge, he wrote, which powered moving devices in the rooms below. The waterwork located at the top of the house also powered wind and string instruments and bells whose music entertained visitors. In the loft was a fascinating scene of mechanical women and men performing various agricultural tasks, such as milking a cow with the milk squirting from the udders, or an ox which pissed strongly, or men tending the cattle or digging, or oxen, cattle, and a rooster making their traditional sounds. Moving down to the waterwork, the visitor saw a ball tossed and danced two yards high by the strength and force of the water spout. And this represented, it seems, the sun with the figure of the earth and half moon and a star, much to the life. There were also birds flying in the water and a couple boys standing uh, nearby, a few meters apart and pissing stoutly one at the other, while a woman had water flowing out of her breasts, while various animals spewed water out of their mouths. This was an interesting place to visit. <laughs> Apparently charged a lot for his drinks. <laughs> Brereton noted other biblical scenes, such as Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden with frogs and toads, which strongly spit out their venom. This, thus, despite his criticism of Peterson, Tunisian was just as inventive and creative as his two-word co-religionists. Thanks to their restriction of the Bible to matters religious, both sides could replicate the natural world without having to ensure faithfulness to traditional interpretations of Scripture. For his part, Peterson, in contrast to Tunison, stressed the inner word of light in his very popular book, The Way to the City of Peace of 1625, and that's the title page, part of the title page there, in which he sought to restore personal spiritual devotion against which what he and Doris feared was a growing materialism among Mennonites, as they were becoming actually quite wealthy, many of them, not all. A lay preacher of the Dobskazin community of Deripe and then of Z Zandam, Peterson, where Descartes was also living, Peterson had no formal theological education and sided with Derice in the two-word dispute. In 1627, a reformed minister, however, accused Peterson of Socinianism, rationalism, despite his promotion of the inner word. Socinianism is just a label. Tunison's accusation that Peterson claimed to invent new windmill technology through the Holy Spirit aside <coughs> We unfortunately know little about Tunison, uh, Peterson's windmill construction. We do know that he emphasized his spiritual detachment from the things of this world and reliance upon God to provide. So he emphasized the inner spiritual development, the natural world he could, he could apply his creativity without restraint. According to Tunison as well, some of Peterson's City of Peace followers were inspired by visions to command the rich to share their goods with the poor, and that's probably why Tunison didn't like them as much. We know much more about two other inventive Dobskesinden from the first quarter of the uh, 17th century, Cornelius Drabel and Robert Robertson Le Canu. Robertson, like Tunisian, was an idiosyncratic figure, but one who definitely fell on the spiritualist side, for he kept moving from one Mennonite fellowship to another, looking for a community that would emphasize an invisible church open to all Christians, and in the end he abandoned them all, 
becoming an explicit independent, who wrote works critical of confessionalism and external religiosity, and arguing that all churches were merely doors into the single true invisible church. Robertson was also a skilled teacher of mathematics and navigation, who published works on these subjects. And you see an example here. But whose most famous work was the short introduction to the feasts of Israel. It doesn't sound all that exciting. But in this, he, he sought to create a chronology of the world from creation to the last judgment based on a skillful, complex, and quite opaque mathematical reading of the biblical record. He used three different types of days as described in scripture. The regular 24-hour one, that's easy, a medium one of 365 days, and a great day consisting of 365 or 360 years, depending. And these he intermingles with a prophetic version of a 1,000-year day, and, that, and uses astronomy as well to divide human history into ages of various lengths, although in the end he doesn't set a firm date for the Last Judgment. I was quite disappointed in that. <laughs> the, bo the book first appeared in 1593 and was reprinted numerous times into the 18th century. It included numerous hand-painted charts, as you, as you see here. It is absolutely wonderful. Now, it must be remembered that one of the greatest, the greatest, Ma uh, scientific mathematical mind of that era, Sir Isaac Newton, spent a great deal of his time and spilled uh, millions of words worth of ink in trying to calculate the age of the earth and the date of the last coming through biblical chronology. And, but he never published his manuscripts. Now, I don't know if Newton read this guy, but it's interesting. Cornelius Drabel was perhaps the greatest inventor among the Dobskizinden, achieving fame in King James I's England. He was vilified as a charlatan by both contemporaries and modern scholars, until recently, uh, when his reputation as an important contributor to early modern science has, has improved considerably. He was disparaged for not having a university education, only artisanal training as an engraver and he was satirized for being an Anabaptist. In the foreword to a short treatise on the nature of the elements, first published in 1604 and reprinted many times, Drabel writes very much as a Mennonite, telling the reader that he composed this work not for my own honor, for I know well the vanity of all fame, <laughs> a bit ironic, are we not all created by one God, innocent and humble? He and his readers are like brothers, he continues, for what do you have that is not graciously loaned to you from God? He advises his readers to examine the riches of your fame, to see if they are not a king, the most glorious jewel that God has created here. And if you abandon all such riches of the world, will you then not give God an imperishable heavenly gift, which is thousands upon thousands times more valuable? Seek instead the fame that is from God, who loves us all. All that we can do here on earth, Drabel continues, is of no worth compared to God's gifts to us. Instead, be thankful and learn humility and the short law from God's Son. Love God above all and your neighbor as yourself. We've been hearing this a lot. This is as Dobskazinda as it gets. Drabel then applies this Dobskazinda approach to his study of nature. Deeply informed by the alchemical works of Paracelsus, Drabel saw the cosmos as a living organism with God as the head uh, corresponding to the microcosm, the human body. And this is an astrological version uh, of that. It's he very heavily utilized in, in early 17th century medicine. For Drabel, the divine spirit infused and activated the cosmos as well as inspiring the human mind. He wrote that the body serving soul and spirit is a firm foundation, the spirit illuminating soul and body like a crystalline heaven, the soul adorns spirit and body with the heavenly ruby defense, and so on. When you're an alchemist, you have to write obscurely. With this confidence, however, Drabel turned to inventing. He explicitly linked his religious worldview with his scientific believing that being inspired by the divine spirit could result in comprehending how the universe worked and to create models of it. The extent of his inventiveness is mind-boggling. Prior to his move to England, in, um, he patented an improved water pump in 1598, 
and a self-winding clock that could operate on its own for years, a fountain for a gate in Middleburg in 1600, and a chimney with an improved draft. One of the most noteworthy things about Drabel's inventions is how similar they were to Tunison's. I'm wondering if Drabel had perhaps aided the innkeeper in some fashion in his creations. I don't know. In England, Drabel showed off the following. First, his amazing clockwork, Perpetuum Mobile, or Perpetual Motion Machine, which you see here. This is an image of it. Um, which, according to one observer, consisted of a small gilded globe on stand in which there was the clockwork mechanism with hands that pointed to the day and month and zodiac sign. On top was another globe presenting the moon's phases, and around the main globe was a glass ring mounted vertically in which a fluid rose and fell, which, of course, operated by barometric pressure, but they didn't know that at the time. This was a wonder. The whole thing amazed James I, but some observers thought it was a sham. Despite this, the king gave Drabel rooms to create further wonders, which included an automatic, automated virginal, which performed music, thanks to the heat of the sun uh, causing the pipes to expand, various optical illusions, possibly performed by a magic lantern or a combination of lenses and mirrors, improvements on the telescope, still in its infancy, and pyrotechnics that wowed observers. The climax, however, seems to have been his submarine, of course, poster which he successfully operated under the Thames River in full view of the king in 1625. Apart from Tunison's critical mention noted above, criticizing inventing a, a, a ship that, a way that men can walk underwater by the spirit, one of those who described it was Constantine Haugens, father of the famed mathematician Christian Haugens in a 1631 writing. Thanks to their innovations in religious identity, leadership, and community, and thanks also to the strong streak of spiritualism that informed so much of their thinking, such Mennonites helped to make innovation in natural philosophy and technology a positive thing in the Dutch Republic. Such curiosities as Drabel's and Tunison's would continue to be a specialty of Mennonites through the 17th and 18th century, epitomized in the cabinet of the Mennonite Levinus Vincent an early natural history museum, which you can uh, see here, containing various wondrous items. Such places were created by members of other denominations, of course, and Ernst Hamm is, uh, has got excellent discussion of these, suggests that it was Vincent's making admission open to anyone at a fee that distinguished his cabinet of wonders from the traditional ones open only to those with formal invitations. So here's the Anabaptist spirit everyone is uh, able to come in. Ham also suggests that it was more broadly the Mennonite ethos, shaped by their non-clerical education and standing, that emphasized useful knowledge of ways and means for manipulating the world mechanically through wind or water power, for making things such as books and maps, for finding places through navigation and astronomy, for healing through medicine and the knowledge of plants, and for describing, ordering, and classifying things. While Tunison may not have dedicated his inventions to the glory of God, as Peterson did for his windmills and Vincent did for his cabinet of wonders, part of his inspiration was from his Anabaptist identity. Now, Ham does not mention Tunison as a Mennonite inventor, as Ham's focus is mostly on the later period. Given the innkeeper's fame, I suggest he may have been an inspiration for later Mennonite creators of cabinets of wonders that Ham does focus on, such as Vincent or the 18th century museum created by Peter Tyler van der Hulst, whose collection of natural history and scientific items remains as a fascinating period museum in Harlem. It is, a good chunk of it remains as an 18th century museum. So it's a museum of a museum. It's absolutely fascinating. By adding Vincent's inventive Mennonite predecessors to the story, such as Tunison, Peterson, Robertson, and Drabel, we can now suggest that 17th century Mennonites were not simply reacting positively to the scientific currents flowing around them, but they were active contributors to this drive to understand the cosmos well before the height of the scientific revolution. While Dutch Mennonites generally avoided spiritualism's extremes of individualism and visionary enthusiasm, they helped shape the Dutch approach to toleration of religious diversity. 
These new approaches to knowledge creation and religious interaction help Mennonites innovate, creating entertaining waterworks, practical mills, or new approaches to navigation. For by emphasizing that scripture's significance was as a guide for pilgrims on the path to spiritual maturity, it was no longer regarded as an authority on the natural world. Instead, Mennonite preachers applied their training in medicine or in artisanal professions to their theology and turned their creative minds freely to their crafts. So by emphasizing the inspiration of the spirit within them to guide their reason, Dobskazinden could be as inventive as Paracelsus was before them. While non-Mennonite Dutch scientists like Christian Haugens, son of Constantine Haugens, who had described Drabel's uh, submarine, are given their due for their contributions to mathematics and creation of clockworks and improved lenses, we must remember that Haugens was a generation younger than our Mennonites. And the innovative spirit that coursed through the veins of them, Peterson, Tunison, Robertson, and Drabel, had already infiltrated the Dutch Republic. Their works and ideas influenced the broader culture in ways that are still little appreciated. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Ah, thank you. Wonderful. Historically grounded, very rich, uh, deepens our understanding of uh, Mennonite history of those who stayed behind in the Netherlands. Around here, we're used to following Mennonites through Prussia, Russia, and here. Uh, so this uh, expands and uh, enhances our understanding. Thank you very much. We have some time, about 10 minutes or so, for a conversation. And so we have an, a microphone right here about the front, so you've got to go toe-to-toe -to -toe with Gary here. Um, I've got a commitment from him to keep his answers short. I'm going to ask for your commitment to keep your questions short as well. So please, uh, come to the mic and uh, introduce yourself, if you don't mind, and uh, Gary will uh, uh, take your questions here, from here. Thank Thanks, you. Paul. Uh, Chris Hubner teach philosophy and theology here. Uh, the question I've been um, trying to formulate has to do with the, the, the artists in Flanders. Um, and, and, and many of the people you're talking about are their descendants when they moved north, thanks right. to William of Orange and all that. Uh, one of the things that happens prior to the Reformation is kind of the shift in visual art from more allegorical depictions to what I suppose very crudely we can call more realistic ones, right? I mean, and, and, and the artisans are, are, um, that you're talking about are involved in all of that. Do you think that's uh, a meaningful part of the backstory? And then kind of the secondary question is, I think both artists and doctors are working with cadavers um, in the period you're talking about. Rembrandt's painting sort of makes that famous. I was wondering about, so visual art as kind of a companion to medicine. Right. Is the question. Okay. Wow. Okay. Great question. I am going to think about that, but I'm, uh, I'll be very brief, as I promised. Um, yes, I think there is. I haven't explored that. Uh, I'll, I'll communicate with Nina now. Uh, thanks. Um, but there is. I, you can see in the middle of the 16th century artists like Peter Bruegel, for example, deeply influenced by spiritualism. And artists uh, tended, and this is also true for David Joris to uh, put sort of hidden messages, uh, coded messages into their works. Um, but you can see this tra transformation, as you suggest, to more naturalistic images by the 17th century. And I think that shows this kind of inner versus outer. The, the spiritual thing is within the person, and now you can just portray the outer world as it is. And I think that, yes, I think that could be a sort of a visual version of the, the transformation I've been talking about. We'll talk more. Uh, so, uh, my name is Carl Koop. I teach here. Um, uh, so, the world, uh, the Dutch, uh, the Dutch Mennonite, Dutch Dolpsgezind um, reality is people are all on a continuum of some kind, and uh, this tension between the inner and the outer, or the the reality of the inner and the outer, is uh, uh, pervasive. Uh, what I find so interesting among the Waterlanders, who are, tend to be on the more spiritualist end, the, more, the emphasis on the inner, inner dimension, is that uh, in some respects, uh, they are also the most sacramental, at least in the language they use to talk about uh, baptism and communion. They will talk about inner baptism, they'll talk about inner communion, but they'll also talk about the holy sacraments. Right. And they'll use that, that language 
um, quite deliberately. Uh, maybe that's more of an observation than a question, although it would be interesting to hear from you um, if there's anything more, more to think about that. Thanks, thanks, Carl. In fact, you've given me an idea, and as soon as I can, I'll write it down. <laughs> Um, I, th I think they, they had that emphasis so much on baptism and the Lord's Supper uh, to act as an anchor. They needed something to firm up their, uh, at least some measure of their external religious identity because they were moving so much within the spiritualist. It, it, it helped them maintain uh, an identity and Galenus Abrahamson, who I'll talk about tonight, um, uh, really insisted both on, on baptism, believer's baptism and the Lord's Supper as core. He wouldn't give those up even in conversations with his Spinozist con congregants. Um, so I think it was a core, it was, a, it was an anchor. It kept, kept, gave them something to, to cling on to, say this is why we're still Mennonite. The collegians, by the way, also practiced baptism for those who weren't baptized as adults. But they practiced immersion. They were the first to practice uh, immersion baptism. Uh, the collegians and and so there's this we still need to have this as an identity even though we allow our minds and our spirits to flow freely uh, around everywhere good morning um, I'm Sandy Lowen and I don't teach here <laughs> um, I have Dutch background, so I'm first generation Canadian. Both of my parents came here in 1951. I'm really interested in, um, and I have a Catholic background too, um, your talk about Satan and the devil, and, um, and here's your book, Dutch Anabaptism and the Devil in England. So I don't hear about Satan in very much in the Mennonite church. Uh, and so, but, but I heard you speak about it a lot in your presentation this morning. Yeah. And maybe this is beyond what you want to talk about, but how do you think that evolved? <laughs> Are you coming tonight? I might have to just be on Zoom. Okay, because that's when I talk about that. Um, I'll, give you, I'll give you the short gist. Um, David Joris, who you saw, was the first person, um, as far as I know, as far as anyone knows, to publish the idea in the vernacular language that the devil did not exist in external world in the natural world. The devil's merely an internal force that he thought could be easily defeated by following his three steps to spiritual maturity, or seven steps, depends. Um, that idea, uh, depreciating an external devil, really was kept alive within those spiritualist uh, and Mennonite circles. And as I will say, the Dobbsgesinden essentially uh, had abandoned any notion of an actual devil. Um, that Catholics and Reformed and Lutherans were still using to burn people as, wit as witches. Um, they also, the Dobbsgesinden, were the major writers of anti-witch hunting treatises. Uh, and um, so I'll talk more about that tonight. So yeah, a very strong, very important current because it's seen as one of the markers of the Enlightenment, getting rid of the devil out of, uh, out of the natural world, out of history, out of any kind of consideration for that. Hi, I'm Elizabeth Whipp, an MDiv student here, and I'm wondering where the women were at. Like you uh -huh. mentioned that they were told to, um, or that there was the threat that inner authority, or inner, listening to the inner spirit would give them authority, but I don't really believe that they just accepted that. So where were no, they yeah. at in, in innovation? <laughs> well, uh, thanks, great question, and it's something I wish I could add more to, it's just that there's so little. Um, but there are scholars uh, working on this. Um, with it, the, Tunison's pamphlet is really focused on all these women who are taking the Spirit's uh, inspiration to proclaim, to have visions, to insist on this, that, or the other thing. And he really didn't like that. So all we, but all we have there is his version of that story, his voice, not theirs. Um, the collegians, however, and many of them, uh, again, were Mennonites, uh, did allow women to speak freely, and uh, Francesco Quattrini, in particular, a uh, scholar friend working in Amsterdam, um, is trying to get their voices. And in the later 17th century, there were a number of, uh, of women writing, speaking, poets, uh, poetesses, uh, even the prophet Antoine Bourguignon, famed uh, prophet, 
of the later 17th century was immersed in the collegiate circles. So that was one place well ahead of, I, I think, anywhere else where women were really given uh, a, a voice. It's just that uh, male historians haven't been all that interested in that until now. And I'm, I'm happy to say uh, they, they are finding some very, Francesco in particular is finding some very interesting material. So stay tuned. I haven't exhausted you, have I? Uh, any last questions? Happy to answer anything. I just can't get out. I'm uh, Roy, uh, Roy Lowen. I also don't teach here. Um, uh, we'll so hold it against you. <laughs> nor am I an early European historian. I'm trying to get my brain around this. This is, I mean, it's absolutely fascinating. <laughs> it's a very great talk. Um, so, cause and effect, like chicken and the egg thing. I think it's just something in passing that there's a traditional view that we know about these guys, but we assume that they are a result of assimilation into a very progressive Dutch society. But then along the way, you're weaving in, I think, to a certain extent at least, maybe there is something about Anabaptism exceptionalism. So, do you want to just sort of articulate that for us? I mean, it's probably a bit of a dangerous area to go into, but do you think that, you know, so Anabaptists are, you know, catapulted out of a medieval frame of mind or whatever, and they were sort of thinking in very radical ways. We like to think of them as radicals, yeah. though they're radicals. Do you think that that sort of turn to, I don't know, costly Christian discipleship or something gets them out of a certain frame of mind that that is, in fact, the genesis of their genius? Yeah, yeah, oh, very good. Um, pretty much put it. <laughs> um, I think it was that, and I've seen this uh, at two levels. One, the grand, the grand level, the disillusionment of Munster uh, was, was, a, was a crushing moment for thousands. I mean, Anna, uh, Dutch Anabaptism uh, at its height was a mass movement. Tens of thousands of people involved in this. Um, the authorities had real reason to be concerned, um, real fear that it would spread and overturn politics as they know it. And then it's crushed almost overnight. And it's that effective disillusionment that uh, I'm interested in tracing. And I see that with David Joris on a personal level. It's easier to, to follow the way he thought. He really thought he was the Messiah, going to be unveiled two and a half years, prophetic time, Christmas Day, 1538. And then suddenly the authorities got wind of all of his followers, some of them former militants, coming to Delft. Why are they coming to Delft? So they round them up, they arrest them. He barely escapes with his life. Uh, his mother's arrested and executed. Uh, about 100 of his followers are executed. That, that changed him. You just see it. It's almost a sharp delineation. So a turn away from the literal, from the prophetic, from the visionary, um, but not wanting to give up everything. And so turning it inwards really helped them to, to adjust, to believe that they could continue on this uh, path to spiritual maturity or, or to transformation um, without incurring the ire of the authorities again. So there, that turn away, whether it's Menno's version or Joris's version, um, I think that was, that was the defining moment. And they, they did not return. And when Tunison writes his pamphlet 100 years after Munster, he, he, he says, I'm fearful that these women and men are going to bring back Munster with their visions. And so that does seem to have clamped down on those women having those visions, as far as I know, no further evidence of it. Um, but, there, but it's this creative tension within the movement between sort of an inner spiritual inspiration dynamic and, and uh, the written scripture and being creative with it, rational with it. I think it's that tension that gave them something that other uh, confessions didn't quite have. I mean, the Reformed, the Calvinist approach to theology came close in, um, in what they did with the devil because the Cal Calvinists, especially even the, you read the Scots Presbyterians, and, and they're talking about the inner struggle in your, in your inner person, in your mind against the devil. 
but they would never go so far as to say that means there is no devil out there. So there's this tendency within all of the Protestant traditions towards this spiritualizing ethic. It's just that our Dobskizen really kept it front and center and kept it and made it explicit. So Paul wants to get up. <laughs> well, uh, thank you very much. Uh, let's take a moment to uh, express our gratitude once again. Thanks, Just one task remains, and that is to warmly invite you to tonight's lecture, which will take place in uh, Marpeck Commons. The title is Mennonites as Innovators of Philosophical Thought in the Dutch Golden Age. I look forward to seeing you there. God bless you all. There'll be lots on the devil. <laughs>